Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Pavlos Protopavas, and I will introduce the overall seminar series. Uh, one announcement before we get started. Um, the next seminar, the next talk, will be April 20th at the Geological Museum across the street, room 100. That lecture, that seminar, is co-hosted with the Harvard Data Science Initiative, uh, and we feature the Professor Ben Schneiderman, He's a professor at the University of Maryland, and he is the founding director of the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory. The talk entitled will be Visual Discovery in Event Analysis, Electronic Health Record, and Other Applications. That's about announcements. Uh, welcome to our fourth annual CISDIN's Lecture Com in Computational Science and Engineering. The Dean's Lecture in Computational Science and Engineering, hosted by the Institute for Applied Computational Science, and is um, reserved for extraordinary speakers who have done innovating and exceptional work in data science and computational science. So we're fortunate today to have Dean Frank Doyle here, uh, Dean of the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science, sorry, Dean of the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, Frank has been the dean since August of 2015. And before that, he was uh, leading a, a distinguished, uh, he was leading a, a big effort in uh, bioengineering at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He has a PhD from Caltech and a bachelor from Princeton, both at uh, chemical engineering. Please help me welcome Dean Frank. Thank you, Pavlos, and thank you all for coming out. I see a lot of new faces in the audience, so it's great to have folks joining us here at IHCS and C's in particular. Um, so I only got to meet David for the first time last night, and we had a delightful conversation over dinner, really fun, wide-ranging uh, series of topics we covered. Uh, David is currently the Charles Young Professor of Astronomy at Princeton, where he has been on the faculty for 30 years, maybe, something in that range. <clears throat> He's also the founding director of a very exciting initiative at the Flatiron Institute. Many of you have heard of this sort of exciting, hybrid, academic, private, foundational type of operation uh, enabled by Simons. Uh, and he's leading, in particular, the um, founding director of the Computational Astrophysics Group there. I want to call out just a couple of things that David uh, is working on or has done. Uh, he and his colleagues built the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe Satellite, WMAP, which helps determine the age, composition, and shape of the universe, basically by looking at fluctuations in the microwave background established using their standard cosmological model. Um, for that, his team was recognized with a breakthrough prize recently. Uh, he also has a host of other accomplishments, um, including uh, MacArthur Fellow recognition. Uh, another project that um, he's working on right now is he's co-chair of the science team for NASA's WFIRST mission, which is a new mission that aims to study the nature of dark energy and properties of atmospheres of extrasolar planets. Pavlos kindly mentioned my background in coming from Princeton as an undergraduate. David is also an undergraduate alum of that fine institution but he corrected whatever uh, errors might have happened there by coming to Harvard for his graduate work. So he has both a master's, a PhD, as well as his bachelor's degree are all in astronomy. So it's a wonderful pleasure to be able to welcome David back to the campus. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, the, so as I start to give my talk and I look around at the audience, of course, see a bunch of faces of people who have seen variants of this talk before, because I'll be talking about the microwave background. Um, though the format, you know, and then I was reminded of being a graduate student here, um, hearing a talk by John McCall and Bill Press whispering in my ear, how famous do you have to be to get to give the same talk over and over again for 15 years? <laughs> we have the answer. Um, yeah. Um, and, but I think this talk will have a bit of a different format in that, well, my plan is the first kind of half of the talk, I want to introduce the physics of the microwave background, explain where we are in cosmology. What I want to do in the second half of the talk is put on my data science hat and actually talk about how we analyze the data and kind of get into the sort of some of the more nitty-gritty stuff that's 
you know, familiar to John and a few others who work on this data, but it's the stuff that we actually don't usually talk about. We're usually talking about the science of our final results, not the steps we take along the way. And I want to give a sense of that because I think along the way there's a bunch of very interesting um, data science problems. Um, so I decided to shift the title of my talk slightly to analyzing the DNA of the universe because what we're looking at are the fluctu in the fluctuations, like in the case of the universe, we're getting at such basic stuff that it's determining the overall properties of the universe. And let me just begin by what I think is where we are in cosmology. I think what we have learned over the past couple decades is a simple model with just a handful of parameters the age of the universe, the density of atoms, the density of matter, how lumpy the universe is, how that lumpiness varies with scale, together with the basic assumptions that general relativity, the physics we see in today's universe is invalid over all time, seems to fit a remarkably large amount of data. Millions of independent measurements of the microwave background positions of millions of galaxies, measurements of the chemistry of the universe, the abundance of deuterium and helium. Lots of pieces seem to fit together. So the universe has so far turned out to be, um, as many ways, almost as simple as we could have hoped for. So you know, with five numbers, we fit all this data. But also very strange. Our current cosmological model implies that Atoms, the stuff that makes up us, makes up only about 5% of the universe. The remaining 95% in two different forms. One, what we call dark matter, which is stuff that we don't know what it is. All we know about it at some level is it behaves like ordinary matter under gravity. It falls into gravitational potential wells. And it doesn't interact much with matter. We have very strong constraints on any interaction with light any interaction with electrons or protons or neutrons. So it's some stuff there. Uh, most popular idea is that it's some new particle we haven't detected yet that we might hope to see at a particle accelerator someday. Um, there are, you know, for the simplest set of par ideas, millions of these particles streaming through my hand every second. We just don't notice it because they interact so weakly. Or the dark matter could be something very different from those models. We just don't know. It's one of the great open questions in physics. And that's the better understood <laughs> part of what makes up the universe besides atoms. The rest of it seems to be energy associated with empty space, what we call dark energy. Um, all we know about this, that stuff is it doesn't respond to gravity much, unlike ordinary matter or dark matter, and that it seems to be uniform, and it seems to be roughly constant with time, and we'd like to, very much like to understand its evolution and, and what it is. When we try to think about this in terms of basic particle physics, where the characteristic scale is the Planck scale, measured in those energy units, the amplitude's 10 to the minus 128. So it's a really tiny number we don't understand. So we don't know what the dark matter is. We don't know what the dark energy is. And of course, another possibility when you have models, no matter how successful they've been with these kinds of crazy ingredients, we may just have the model wrong. Right? And people looking back on cosmology a hundred years from now may look back on it the same way we look back on phlogiston, right, where stuff was invented to so that things would make sense, and that's because we were missing some basic fundamental part of physics. And one of the things that motivates a lot of what I'll talk about is a desire to answer these questions. There's another piece here, too, that goes in when we talk about the properties of the fluctuations, which is when we see the fluctuations of the microwave background, one of the, I think, bizarre features is 
parts of the sky over there are correlated with parts of the sky over there. And the reason that's bizarre is in our standard cosmological model, those two parts of the sky have never had a chance to interact. So how do they know to be correlated? Our, the most popular answer to that is that the universe underwent this very early period of acceleration we call inflation. Other possibilities include that the universe, before there was a big bang, there was a period, it went, the universe went through a cycle of expansion, collapse, re-expansion. And that was, provides another potential mechanism. And one of the other th questions we'd like to understand is what insights this give us into the origin of the universe. How, does, how do we get to these ideas? To talk about them, I have to begin by teaching you all special relativity, for those who haven't seen it. The key idea in special relativity for us as astronomers is light travels at a finite speed. It takes light a few nanoseconds to get from, the, from me to the back of the room, so you're actually seeing me not as I am now, but as I was a few nanoseconds ago. Change doesn't happen on that time scale. For humans, it's not a big effect. We look at the sun, we see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And when we look out to Mars, and I thought this was um, you know, really nicely captured in the movie The Martian, for those of you who've seen that, it takes, it can take sometimes 30 minutes for a signal to go back and forth. And you speak, and then it takes a while to hear that answer. The further out you go in space, the further back you go in time. If you go out, you know, uh, 30 light years, and you are uh, orbiting a star um, 30 light years away from the sun, you would observe Earth as it was 30 years ago, and this building wasn't here, and I had a full head of hair. <laughs> but I was also here, so you have to be the right distance. Um, so the further out we go in space, the further back we go in time. When we look out at distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were five billion years ago or 10 billion years ago. What I'll be talking about today are observations of the microwave background, where we're looking out 13.8 billion years ago, and we're seeing the universe as it was back then, uh, only about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Everyone good with special relativity? All right, general relativity. <laughs> general relativity consists of two key ideas. Matter tells space how to curve, and the curvature of space tells matter and light how to move. What that means, and this is when we first tested this, was when you observe a planet, sorry, a star behind the sun, light from that star gets deflected. So instead of observing the star at position A, you'd observe it at position B. And Einstein realized this effect would be there. In 1915, he predicted this effect. The, uh, when he first did the calculation in 1915 um, for the 1915 eclipse, he had not fully understood how to do the relativity correct calculation correctly. His prediction was off by factor two. Einstein was both smart and lucky. The First World War was on, and the weather was bad, so no one made eclipse observations in 1917. Um, but by, uh, that, by the end of 17, he had figured out the full version of how to do the calculation, got the factor two right. And then in 1919, uh, the famous eclipse expeditions made the first check of this theory. And there we go, here's from the New York Times, I love this headline, light all askew in the heavens. You know, this was 1917, so it was mostly men of science. Over 100 years, we've made modest progress. Um, more or less agog over the results of the eclipse expedition. Stars, act, this is actually more another example of New York Times fake news. <laughs> it turned out that the stars were where Einstein calculated them to be. So that 
you know, was the great success of the theory. And kind of, re, you know, and over the last hundred years, we've continued to reinforce this basic idea of general relativity. Now, the key idea that relativity implies for cosmology, and this, you know, I think for most non-physicists, this is the thing that's most disturbing about cosmology, is the universe is expanding that we are constantly, in some sense, creating space. And that the distance, uh, and that it's not expanding, the name Big Bang is very misleading. It's not expanding in an explosion from a single point, but rather the whole, all space-time is being uh, generated everywhere. And the picture I like to think of as my kind of physical model is I suppress one dimension. I imagine us living on a two-dimensional surface, of a ball. And each galaxy sits on this ball. And what's growing with time is the size of the sphere. And then I think of all of space-time as a sphere, where where we are today is one surface of the sphere. And the radius of the sphere is time. So each surface in the sphere is a different time. And the universe, as the universe ages, the, we move out further and further on the sphere. And I think that physical model is a good one for several reasons. It makes clear that there's no special place in the universe. You know, the Big Bang didn't happen, you know, here or in Andromeda. It happened everywhere on the sphere. The Big Bang is a moment in time at the center of that sphere. That's the initial singularity. In, you know, we don't know the answer to the uh, question often asked, well, what was before then or what not, right? This either is when time began, that's the Hawking Hartle version of this, or there was a bounce before this, or this emerged out of some quantum foam or something else, which is a completely open question in physics, what happened then. For the purposes of my talk, we're not going to focus on that, but rather what the universe looked like about 380,000 years after the Big Bang and its subsequent evolution. But you should think of all this in the context of this expanding universe model. OK, so here's our quick history of the universe. The universe starts out very hot and dense. As it expands, it cools. And about, you know, in the first few minutes, you form almost all the helium and deuterium in the universe. About 400,000 years later, the atoms form. That's about when we're looking back to, when we look at the microwave background. About 100 million years later, stars start to form. And, you know, galaxies like our own, significant pieces are being assembled by, say, a billion years after the Big Bang. The sun formed about four and a half million years ago. So it's sort of an interesting time scale. It's about a third of the age of the universe. So it's, you know, relatively recent, but time, you know, it, it's a, in some ways a young universe, think, if you think about it that way. Um, you know, and we're over here. In detail, when we look at the microwave background, we're looking at a time when the universe made the transition from ionized to neutral. And we sometimes talk about looking at the surface of last scatter. It's not an infinitely thin surface. Um, it's all, I think of it physically like looking out on a cloudy day at the cloud layer. And you're sort of looking through the transparent atmosphere, which doesn't have water vapor, to the layer of clouds. And you're seeing fluctuations in the surface of the clouds. And that's an interesting place to look because you're then looking all the way back in time and seeing conditions back then. So when we look at this microwave background, it's this leftover heat from the Big Bang, right? So the universe starts out hot, this radiation's expanding, and you know, we're, we're seeing it everywhere. It's filling space. Those of you old enough to have watched television with a TV antenna, you have seen the microwave background. It's about 1% of the static 
when you turn your TV between stations. Uh, those of you who are used to only cable TV, you have at least heard the microwave background when you, you've tuned your radio between stations. And so, you know, a fraction of the static that you hear comes from the microwave background. The challenge, of course, is just a fraction. So this is why you have to design very careful experiments that uh, either are in space or in some uh, you know, optimized environment like the South Pole or a mountaintop in Chile. Uh, to go and get away from all that background stuff that filled your TV screen, get away from that 99% and study it in detail. The microwave background was first detected by Penzias and Wilson at Bell Labs, and what they saw was this nearly uniform radiation everywhere. As data improved, so the amplitude of that radiation is three degrees above absolute zero, at about the three millikelvin level, we can see a dipole with a hot spot in the direction of our motion, and this, and this in the anti-direction. And then when we get down to the level of a few microkelvin, the COBE experiment was first able to make detections of the fluctuations. What's shown in these figures is a plot of the whole sky. So we're taking, just like you can take a globe and project it onto an ellipse like that, where you know, this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, and this is the equator. These maps are similar, and we're taking the sky around us with a, the North Galactic Pole and the South Galactic Pole here and here, and just projecting them on this image. In doing so, the plane of our galaxy, the Milky Way, lies here. And all this red stuff is emission from our own galaxy, either from dust in our galaxy, or from relativistic electrons, um, you know, and a few other parts of our galaxy. And this is the stuff as cosmologists. This is the smudge on the window, the dust that builds up on the window, and this is the beautiful scene we want to see in the distance. This stuff is all quite nearby. This is stuff that's 5,000, 10,000 light years away. You know, there are people, I think he's here, Doug Finkbinder likes the stuff, but you know, the rest of us, we just think of it as a nuisance. And uh, you know, we're, we're interested in the stuff in the distance. So one of the things that was mentioned I was very involved with was the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. And what we did with this is just give you a sense of how the field evolved as we started measuring things at higher resolution. That's the same map you saw, same sky you saw from Kobe, but now we've improved the resolution you know, by an order of magnitude and sensitivity. And you can start to see fluctuations on much smaller scales. And then we took measurements at five frequencies because the foregrounds are frequency dependent. This allows us to remove them and make a clean map of the sky. And this is sort of the universe's baby picture. It's this is what the fluctuations look like. And what we want to do is characterize the statistical properties of these fluctuations. One of the things that's remarkable about this pattern is how simple it is. It basically looks statistically like noise. It's a, it's a Gaussian random field. So that means there's sort of no patterns that emerge there. And you know the patterns that we see, like my most favorite one is the letters SH. Honor, you know, it was the universe honoring Stephen Hawking. Um, we think are a statistical fluctuation uh, driven by the fact that uh, as humans, we're really good at finding patterns. And this is why we do statistics, so that we can, uh, the, the letters we see in the sky, the fish we see in the clouds, um, we check their statistical validity. And the basic statistics we use to analyze this data is we measure the two-point fluctuations of the sky. So I'll show a power spectrum of the sky, the amplitude of fluctuations versus scale. For those of you who aren't familiar with power spectrum, just think of throwing down circles of different sizes and measuring what the characteristic scale of fluctuations are. And ask what circle has the, is the right scale to pick up most of the fluctuations. And kind of by eye, you could see that about this scale 
is the typical scale of the fluctuations. It's sort of a, your eye picks out a scale of about a degree. And when we do, there's Stephen Hawking, that we, we see that. And the physics of these fluctuations can be understood as the physics of sound waves. And this is uh, Dan Eisenstein's here, and Dan is one of the people who really, uh, I think, elucidated this most clearly. And I think of it as, what I'm doing is I'm taking all these dark matter and atoms, and I concentrate them in a region. I create a region of excess density. I'll do that right now. There you go. You create an excess density region. It's overpressured. It generates a sound wave. The sound wave propagates out. And it propagates out, in our case, about 380,000 years. That sets the radius of this. And we're left with the dark matter not moving in the center. The uh, protons, electrons, and photons forming that ring. That gives us, we combine many of these things. And what we ski on, see on that sky is just a whole bunch of those sound waves and the patterns they produce. One way to analyze the data that I um, find intuitive, it's the, not the way we actually do it in detail, is you take all the cold spots you see in the map and you stack around all the cold spots. And this is an analysis actually first done by Ichiro Komatsu, but this is the Planck team version of this. And we take each cold spot, and around it, we see a hot ring. And the top plot here is the data. The bottom part is our best theoretical fit. And you see the same pattern. Here's stacking on cold spots. Here's stacking on hot spots. And while I'm focusing initially on temperature, we also measure the polarization of the microwave background. And we can again repeat this analysis and look at the observed, observed and predicted patterns of polarization. And this is sort of a degree scale here. And we could basically read off the basic properties of the universe just from this pattern. We know the radius of this ring. It's about 380,000 light years. That's nature holding up a ruler to us. Well, once I've got one side of the triangle, I measure the angle. I know how long light's been traveling. It's about 13.76 billion years uh, with an uncertainty of uh, less than a percent. So just geometrically, the size of this ring basically gives us a measurement of the age of the universe. We see this cold spot in the center. The cold spot comes from dark matter. By measuring the amplitude of the cold spot relative to the amplitude of the hot spot, that gives us the ratio of the density in dark matter to the density in atoms. And the properties of the thickness of this ring depends on how the photons diffuse among the electrons. And that depends how many electrons there are. So that gives us a measurement of the density of atoms. Then I go measure the overall amplitude of the signal. And I measure how it varies with scale. And those are my five basic numbers. So I just kind of by eye, we can all start to infer all that. What we do in practice is we go to the data. And this is the version of the data now about a decade ago. And we'll go forward in time soon. And we fit to the data our best fit model of the amplitude versus scale, pull off the parameters, and uh, you know, fit our basic model. And then that tells us what the universe looked like 13.7 uh, billion years ago. We put in gravity. We run it forward with time. And then we compare this to the universe today in terms of the statistical properties of galaxies. So if I were to give this talk a decade ago, I would have said everything fits. We've got a very successful 
cosmological model. What's happened since? Well, on the experimental side, one of the big steps forward was the European Planck satellite that measured the fluctuations with higher precision, higher resolution, and now, not at five, but at nine frequencies, so that you had uh, be able to construct even better models of what's going on with the galaxy to remove those foregrounds. And here's where we were when the Planck data first came out, and I view this plot as both a tremendous experimental and theoretical triumph. What you see is data in blue from WMAP, data taken from Chile from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, a project that I'm part of and at the time was led by Lyman Page. Data in red from the South Pole Telescope, a telescope led by John Kallstrom at UChicago. And finally on top of this is the Planck data. And you can see the four experiments measuring fluctuations at a few millionths of a degree all agree remarkably well. Right, so that's first just a great experimental triumph, very different techniques, different places, they all fit together. And then the curve going through the data is the model. And it's a model that really goes back to work done by Sinyaev and Zoldovich and Peebles in the 1970s, and it fits the data very nicely. Recently, things have started to get interesting. So I've been emphasizing everything fitting and this overall triumph. But as the data continues to improve, the fits get less, a bunch of the things start to get out of family. So here are measurements of the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant. And this black line here is what we get when we extrapolate from the microwave background. And that does, gives us an expansion rate you know, of about 67. And the blue curve is what happens if we take observations of, in this case, we use observations of uh, the baryon acoustic oscillation scale, these same sound waves, let us calibrate things here, and then use the supernova data and let us extrapolate here. And that all fits, and you, you know, these two agree rather nicely. The third curve comes from local measurements using primarily supernova to measure the distance to nearby galaxies. This is the classic way astronomers have done this, though over the last decades they've vastly improved the way we measure distance to nearby stars and the nearby galaxies. And, you know, this is work from actually another a fellow Harvard graduate student, Adam Rees, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on discovering dark energy. And Adam and his group get a value more like 72. Now, if the error bars were a bit bigger, as they were five years ago, this would all be a great triumph. 68 and 72 aren't that far apart. When I was a graduate student here, cosmologists argued whether the Hubble constant was 50 or 100. Um, and at the time, the error bar is about as good, um, or claimed to be as good, so the discrepancy was quite large. Um, so what's going on here? Fundamentally, one of three things. Either the error should be bigger here, the error should be bigger here, or there's a systematic, or we're missing some physics. The easiest physics to add to make the data fit is to say, well, we don't understand the properties of dark energy well. Maybe the amount of dark energy is growing with time. And the universe is not just accelerating, but the rate of acceleration is growing. This possibility has profound and I think depress quite depressing implications for our future. Because if the acceleration continues to grow with time, eventually galaxies get torn apart. Then after we tear apart galaxies, we start tearing apart planets and stars, and then atoms, and then nuclei itself. So everything is destroyed in a big rip. And, you know, uh, when some of this data came out, I remember there was a, an article about this in 
I got contacted in the beginning of November in 2016 about what I thought about the Big Rip. And I explained at the time that I viewed the Big Rip kind of like the Trump presidency. <laughs> that it was frightening to contemplate, possibly consistent with the data, but it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so as I read the news, I reconcile myself by saying, as bad as things are, it's not like all the atoms in the universe are being torn apart. <laughs> and you know, these discrepancies are at the kind of three-ish sigma level are sort of all over the place, whether we use baryon acoustic observations <coughs> using uh, galaxies or using Lyman alpha. And most recently, um, the discrepancies have appeared, and uh, they've been showing up here for a while, but the data has just gotten better and better in measurements of the amplitude of fluctuations. So this is measurements of the amplitude of fluctuations versus the density of matter. This is just normalizing the density of matter. This is the best fit value from the Planck experiment. And this is with the error bar somewhat inflated by allowing the neutrino mass to vary. And this is um, the best, current, what I would say is the current best ground measurements from the dark energy survey measuring the amplitude of fluctuations. And if you just take what, you know, are the two, the, the best measurements of local amplitude of fluctuations from the dark energy survey, Planck's measurements of the microwave background, combine them, you conclude that the universe, the best fit model is a value of W of minus 1.3, and that's at four sigma, the universe is being torn apart in a big rip. Um, cosmologists don't talk about this because they sort of don't believe the result, even though it's the best data sets we have at the moment. Because when you throw in additional data sets, it drives the result back to the standard value. But it suggests there's something going on. And there's either a bunch of systematics we don't understand, since we're trying to do bigger and larger versions of these experiments, we certainly want to figure out what those are. We're underestimating our errors in some way. Or what would be the most exciting possibility, perhaps the most frightening one, given the possibility of a big rip, is that there's a new physics. So what should we do? Well, I think the answer is we need to get better data and improve our analyses. And we're getting better data in a bunch of different ways. I want to focus on the work we're doing in Chile with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, um, looking to uh, measure the microwave background at higher precision. And uh, this is a big collaboration with now 31 institutions. Uh, here's some of the people at one of our meetings. And give you a sense of what we're trying to do. Um, we now have measurements of about 20,000 square degrees with better precision than the Planck experiment. So this is Planck on a patch, and this is what we have with ACT. We have about five times the angular resolution, or about five times the sensitivity now. And we're in the midst of analyzing um, the first set of that data with our new detectors. And um, what we're trying to do is distinguish, kind of remeasure the Hubble constant. And it's a subtle effect. So these are temperature measurements. And we're trying to distinguish the difference between this line, the solid line, and the dashed line. That's the difference in the parameters. Um, so slightly clearer, if you look at temperature and polarization, which is what we're measuring well, and you can see the difference between these two models start to become at least visible by eye. Though with the data we've published to date, not quite good enough to distinguish yet. But what we, with the data we have in hand, our error bar should be about four times smaller. So then things get interesting. So what we've done is we've taken the camera of the telescope, we've upgraded it with a new camera, and what I want to 
talk, go through this picture, then talk about some of the details. This is what happens to the information. Comes from the microwave background, passes through the large-scale structure, the galaxies of the universe, gets affected and deflected by that. Then through our own Milky Way, where we get signal from dust. Then through our atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is far hotter than the microwave background. Microwave background's at three degrees. The signal we're looking for is at micro Kelvin. Um, even at wavelengths at which the atmosphere is mostly transparent, we're still picking up a signal of a few degrees, tens of degrees from the atmosphere. That comes into the telescope. We pick it up from the camera. We then have to take the raw data, calibrate it, cut the data. Um, one of the things we're doing right now is cutting the data by eye. We have you know, uh, cut, some of our experimental colleagues go through the data. This is actually something where we're, we're now transitioning to machine learning, because as we get 10 times more data, we do not want to hire uh, 10 times more people to go through the same data. Uh, then need to calibrate the maps, look at its basic statistics, and then infer the cosmology. And I want to now look at sort of the data analysis part of that. Here's our upgraded camera first and some of the people, and actually sort of show just some of the pieces of what we do. Right, so we start with our different data, combine them to maps, and I'm going to talk about this piece first. We then compare this to data from other experiments, look at null tests, look at the statistical properties, calibrate, cross-correlate them with other data sets, and finally get our measurements of, the, say, the Hubble constant. I'll just run it. This is actually what our data looks like. Um, this is the raw data. It looks very different microwave background data than typical astronomical data where you point a telescope at a point in the sky. And most of what you see in your camera, depends on what you're studying, is signal. You're seeing you mostly image from the sky. When we look at the microwave background, most of what we're seeing is a combination of atmosphere and then detector noise. Most of this, in this case, this overall drift in the signal is the atmosphere moving overhead. So you have to first characterize the atmosphere and remove that. And then sometimes the detectors get behave badly and just have to remove those. So one of the steps from this is we go and we make maps out of the data. Here's the three of our leading map makers. And I was told I was allowed to show a few equations. So just to give us, what we're doing is we're modeling the data as what's on the sky times a mapping matrix plus noise. Now the properties of our noise um, it's not white noise. It's at, a lot of it's atmospheric noise, so it has significant time correlation. So we have to then fit for this, and our basic assumption is the sky doesn't change and the noise will average out. So we want to fit the data, weighting it with the noise. We then have to solve this equation. These are big equations to solve, we're looking at, of order 10 to the 8, actually now more like 10 to the 9 uh, data points in the time series, even when we integrate it up a little bit. Mapping that into, you know, a map that has, you know, of order 10 to the 7 pixels in the map. So we've got this enormous matrix that we need to solve these equations for. We, of course, don't want to invert this matrix. What we want to do is iteratively solve this equation. And that requires having um, a good preconditioner and having a good model of what's going on with the noise. And the noise, because of a lot of it's atmospheric, has pretty complicated structure. So we work hard at characterizing the noise structure um, and then 
and then solve these equations. So that's our map making step. Once we've made the map, we then have to understand all the things that go on. So this is an early version of the map. And when you look at this map, this does not look like the signal you've seen before. You see all these stripes across the map parallel to the ground. Hmm, parallel to the ground. We'll probably have some ground pickup. So you, then you go back to your map making. You then project things into the ground coordinates and look at the signal you see as a function of where you are on the sky. You can then remove that. Um, you then start looking at things like, can we measure the side lobes of the telescope? Do we, you know, when we're observing over here, and the moon, which is pretty bright, is over there, or now that we're observing also in the daytime, when the sun is over there, do we pick up signal in our side lobes? Because even if the signal is down by a factor of a, a million, that's going to show up if it's coming from the moon or sun. So now we project our data into moon-centered coordinates. So we ask where the moon is at any given time. And this is what our maps look like in moon-centered coordinates. And then we start throwing out the data whatever the moon is within a certain fraction of the sky of our, our viewing angle. And the way we make our, do our analyses is continuing to move forward like this. One of the limitations, one of the things that kept us from getting the data out for close to a year is um, we've kept seeing these funny correlations between our temperature and polarization signal that made no sense. And what we finally understood was when we started to take maps of Saturn as a source, look at it in polarization, that we had these funny side lobes that were showing up not in Q polarization, but only U polarization. And we think these are actually reflections off of the filters in the camera producing um, a polarization signal. And once you understand this, um, you can model this. You know, once you've measured your point spread, your response function, you sort of go back to this equation and you now treat your, your measurement matrix as you're not just picking up the signal here, but you're picking up a little bit of the signal there with plus sign, a little bit of signal there with a minus sign. And you can, um, as you iteratively solve that, you remove that. And this is, these steps are the basic pieces in how we get to maps. Once we get to maps, the next step is going from those maps eventually to characterizing the galaxy and our cosmological parameters. What we are doing this time, which we have not done so much in the past, is we've made this process what we call blind. So we are not computing. So I do not know whether we get a Hubble constant. Uh, I do know that our data is good enough that we could distinguish a Hubble constant of 68 from 72 that our data is independent of Planck and will have error bars that are about the same as Planck, perhaps a little bit better, with the data we're working with right now, with the data that we actually have in hand but haven't fully analyzed, it should be even better. But I don't know what the answer is because what we're trying to do is make sure that we pass first all of our null tests and then a series of other tests of our beam and things before we ever com compute a cosmological parameter. Because this, as you saw, those changes are pretty subtle. We don't want to um, be biased in how we do this. Particularly, don't, we don't want to suffer from the sort of, let's improve our, our maps and our analysis until we agree with previous values, at which point it's time to publish. Um, historically, people have done that a lot in science. 
Um, so, uh, you know, we sat down and made, uh, so we filled the blackboard. I think we have the picture here. It was next. Yeah, so behind, this is the analysis team that we were working with. Behind us is a list which then goes through the blackboard here, here, and here. We took pictures before we erased the board that lists all the stuff that we will do before we try to measure parameters. And we are about halfway through the list. And we're doing things in parallel, so it's, we're, we're a bit further along than that, that sounds. Um, and you know, the way the team ends up working is uh, different individuals are really taking the lead on different pieces in this analysis. Um, a very important part of any analysis like this um, is having very good simulations. So we have simulations of the sky uh, to get its noise properties to test our understanding of the noise matrices. We've generated um, you know, more than 1,000 cosmological realizations so that we make sure that our, the way we recover parameters from those simulations uh, rec recovers things in an unbiased way. And we have generated an end-to-end -end simulation that captures everything that has an, have unknown sets of cosmological parameters, except, is she here? Yes, she's the only person who knows the cosmological parameters. <laughs> uh, not of the universe, but of our simulation. <laughs> and um, we will, um, you know, wait until we pass that um, till we find out what the answer is. Um, you know, after all, while the fate of the universe isn't, doesn't depend on what answer we get, our current understanding of the fate of the universe does, so we don't want to be prejudiced by what we think. Um, but we're making real progress on improving those measurements. And while I focus today on the work we're doing with our microwave background experiment, what's going on in cosmology is we're pushing hard on all these different ways of measuring the properties of the universe. Whether we're measuring using the large scale distribution of galaxies through baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, you know, so Dan Eisenstein and his group here have been leading a lot of that work here. Measuring gravitational lensing to get the amplitude of fluctuations and uh, you know, the dark energy survey data that I showed was from their first year. They actually have about five years of data now and they're working on their own analysis program to improve those. We have some very nice data from a Hyper Supreme Cam, a camera on the Subaru telescope that Princeton's part of. Um, the supernova data improves our measurements of this distance scale, um, which you know, I think shows one of the strongest discrepancies, this difference in the Hubble constant, is going to improve significantly by the end of the month. Uh, the Europeans are about to release data from their, the Gaia satellite, which is going to give us much more accurate measurements of distances to the uh, nearest uh, to stars in our own galaxy, and will let us calibrate uh, our measurements of the size of the universe better. So what if two things will happen? Um, these anomalies are either going to go away and everything will fit, and that'll be a great triumph, or we'll learn that there's yet more physics that we need to understand uh, in what determines the basic properties of the universe. So it's, I hope I've gave you a sense of the exciting times we're in and uh, what we actually do when we go through the data. So thank you. Great, so take some questions. So, yes. Can you give us a sense of how things might improve with off, off the well, earth I mean, observations? The Say there's a moon-based telescope or when the Webb telescope gets up and is operational? So um, the Webb telescope is going to tell us a tremendous amount about how galaxies form and evolve. 
tremendous amount about exoplanets. Um, the Webb telescope is really optimized to look at a little piece of the sky. So it's, you know, I think of what we do as scientists as falling into two categories. We either study individuals in great detail, or we look at the statistical properties of large samples. The, the, all of the surveys I'm talking about look at statistical properties of large samples. That's what we do for galaxies. That's what we do for microwave background. Webb is going to be in the category more of being the most powerful thing we've ever done to study individuals in great detail, our properties of a handful of galaxies. So I don't think that Webb will be as significant in advancing cosmological parameters. What we will be doing from space, uh, we hope, is I mentioned in my introduction that I'm co-chair of the science team for the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, WFIRST. And the idea there is to, to do a survey of the sky in the infrared from space, very well-controlled environment. When that launches in 2025, we hope that will be a significant advance on those parameters. Um, the moon is not a particularly attractive place to do science. Um, when I chaired the astrophysics subcommittee for NASA, we looked at that and uh, did not recommend significant lunar program. Uh, the Decadal Survey, National Academy has looked at this a number of times. Um, so uh, having just rotated off the NASA Advisory Council, um, I was disappointed to see the decision made to the return to the moon. We do not have a NASA administrator at the moment. We just have a, we have an, uh, a National Space Board, which has no scientists on it. So uh, we do not have scientists playing a significant role in uh, space policy, um, as in other areas. Uh, so I'm, uh, I am not, uh, you know, there's a group of people who are big enthusiasts for the moon. I like to think of them as lunatics. <laughs> Alyssa. Students gave this very prescient talk about axions and photinos, in which you said, and I will live to see the day of precision cosmology. And you were totally right. So now I'm going to put you on the spot. And I'm going to say, do we do something wrong in the analysis, or is it new physics? Which one do you want to bet on? Something uh -huh. wrong in the analysis. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, the mo that's, that's usually the right bet, right? You know, most of the time, you know, these are hard analyses. Um, I have ideas on what's, I, I understand the CMB analysis best, so I have things that I am suspicious about. The, there's a uh, tension between, you know, if you measure the cosmological parameters from Planck using data on angular scales larger than a sixth of a degree, so L of a thousand, you will get one answer. If you look at data on uh, smaller scales, you get a different answer and the differences are pretty big. The Planck data um, is um, the shape of the peaks are a bit off. Um, OK, I'll, just, we'll get, I'll get a little, my, my suspicion. Okay. The difference between these two curves are really small. If I lower the amplitude of the Planck points by just a little bit, it will change the parameters. Well, a little bit of this scale versus this scale. What does that mean is the transfer function for map making could, if it was off by one to two percent, that would um, be enough to explain the difference in parameters. You're saying data size could save the universe. From <laughs> its fate of being torn apart. I am confident that the referee of that paper said there needs to be end-to-end -end simulations of the transfer function for this result to be robust, and that the response of the team was, in their 2015 paper, that they plan to do this, and this will be in their next science paper, which will come out within the year. So, 
Uh, it's hard. It's hard to get all these things right. And it could not, it may turn out not to be that. But you know, for the Planck data, that's what I suspect. Um, for the supernova data, uh, let's see what the local distance scale turns out to be. You know, when we're about to get better data there. And, you know, we don't, we don't know what causes type 1a supernova. We don't understand their underlying physics. And just because we don't understand something doesn't mean there's not a systematic associated with them. I mean, we're calibrating our measurements with something that we don't, uh, calibrators we don't fully understand. It's real hardcore astronomy in that you observe stuff and calibrate. We don't understand the underlying physics behind the calibration. So I'm always, so I'm just, I'm nervous that at the 1% level there's something we're missing. So that, that would be my, my guess on what's going on. Okay. Uh, yes? Possible alternate physics source you mentioned was a change to the dark energy equation state. Is there any space where alternate dark matter models might show up in this analysis, or are we not really sensitive to those here? Um, we are sensitive to some dark matter physics. Um, in one form of dark matter that we know is there is neutrinos. Um, I mean, there and uh, neutrinos show up and affect the microwave background. Neutrino neutrino interactions. For things that look like standard cold dark matter, as we look at the variance, you know, axions versus photinos, or even things like self-interacting dark matter, their effect on the CMB is small. They tend to show up what has been, I think, the most sensitive um, astronomical measurements we have for those that detailed stuff at the moment. It's actually observations of dwarf galaxies. Because when we get down to the smallest scales, that's where things should tend to show up with dark matter. So that for understanding dark matter right now, that's the forefront. Okay. Great. Thanks again.